Welcome to the video for chapter 13 of the Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, which is going to tell you about long I and long U stems and about Visarga Sandhi. Chapter 9 introduced us to long A stems. This chapter introduces us to two more noun stems that also end in long vowels, namely long I and long U stems. All three of those are grammatically of feminine gender. All long A stem, long I stem, long U stem nouns are feminine. Long I and long U stems have endings that are very similar to those of long A stems and um, that are very, very similar to each other. So that's why they are here looked at in comparison with each other. And of both long I and long U stems, we have two varieties each namely so-called regular and so-called monosyllabic or root stems. So what you will be introduced to here is quite a lot of information and thus we should walk through it step by step. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the regular long I stems first. So what you see here is a comparison of the singular forms of long A and regular long I stems. And um, I hope that the forms of the long A stems are familiar to at this point. And you'll see that the forms of the long I stems actually are quite similar. So, for example, in the nominative singular, we have sena and nadi. Nadi means river, by the way. So both of these just end in their long vowel. They're basically just the stem, sena, nadi, or they look identical to just the stem. The vocative, sene, as opposed to nadi, doesn't really have uh, much of a link. So the new vocative nadi, you really need to memorize independently. But then when we come to the accusative sinam nadim, you see that these are formed exactly in parallel. Namely, you take the stem and then you add an m to give you sina plus m, sinam, nadi plus m, nadim. And then with the rest of these cases, instrumental, dative, ablative, genitive, locative, you can see that we actually have the same endings, namely a, i, Ach, ach, and am. But what's different is that in the case of sena, they're not added just straightforwardly to the stem, but you have this sena, ya, sena, ya, sena, ya, sena, ya, sena, yam. Whereas in the case of nadi, you have just nadi plus these endings, a, i, i, sorry, a, i, ach, ach, am added to the stem. And what happens is something that we've seen many times before, namely in front of another vowel, the E at the end of nadi becomes or turns into its um, semi-vowel counterpart, y, and so we don't have nadi a, but we have nadi a, nadia, nadiai, nadiach, nadiach, nadiam. These parallels continue in the dual and plural. In the nominative, vocative, accusative dual, well, we actually have different forms, namely sini for the long A stems and nadiau for the long I stems. But the au might remind you of uh, the form that we find in the masculine short A stems, namely narau, same ending, au. In the instrumental dative ablative, then we have a complete parallel, namely you take the stem, sina or nadi, and you add biham. In the genitive locative, we then have basically something that also happened in the singular, namely we have this ending och that in the case of the long I stems is added straight to the stem, nadi och gives you nadi och, whereas in the case of long A stems we have some changes in the middle of the word, so we have this form sinai och, but the ending och is the same in both. Then in the plural, we have a small discrepancy in nominative, vocative, accusative, which are all identical in the case of long A stems. But in uh, long I stems, we have nadiach for nominative and vocative and nadich for the accusative. So make sure you remember those. But then with the other cases, it's completely parallel. Sena, bich, nadi, bich. You take the stem and you add bich. In the dative ablative, sena, biach, nadi, biach. Again, you take the stem and you add biach. Sena, nam, nadi, nam. You take the stem, you add nam. And then the locative, sena, su, nadi, shu, you take the stem, you add su. But in the case of long I stems, because of the rookie rule, the su then changes into shu. Up next are the root long I stems. You can recognize a root long I stem by the fact that the stem without the endings is just one syllable. Nadi, two syllables, but what we've got here, di, meaning thought, is just one syllable. 
Now, the difference between the regular and the root long I stems are the following. First of all, in the nominative and vocative, we have a uh, visaga added. So it's not nadi and nadi, but it's dich and dich. Then from the accusative onwards, we basically have forms that um, are not monosyllabic, that have more than one syllable. Um, and this is the result of the e always turning into e y rather than turning into just y in front of another vowel. So in the accusative, rather than having nadim, we have di yam, and we will re-encounter this ending am actually in consonant stems when we come to them. So in front of this am, the e changes into a y, but rather than having a form yam, um, we uh, have the e changing into e y, and that turns the form into di yam, which is, I suppose, easier to pronounce. Then in front of the endings a, i, ach, ach, am, we again have the e not changing just into y, but we have it changing into e y. So di ya, di yai, di yach, di yach, di yam. However, in the dative, ablative, genitive, and locative, we have an alternative set of forms for these root long i stems, which again consist of the, the d, then the e, which has changed into e y, and then we have endings that we haven't seen yet in this form, namely e, ach, ach, and e, but these are endings that we will soon come across when we come to consonant stem endings, because those you will see are exactly the same as consonant stem endings. In the dual and plural, there are some cases where regular and root long i stems are exactly parallel, and some where they're slightly different. The ones where they are slightly different are those where the ending begins with a vowel. So, for example, in nominative, vocative, accusative, we have nadiau, nadi plus au gives us nadiau, but in uh, the case of t, we don't get diau, but we get diau. So again, the result is a form that has more than one syllable, diau. In the case of um, nadi biam, di biam, it's exactly parallel. So here we have an ending that begins with a consonant, and in front of these endings that begin with consonants, um, the two stems are completely parallel, nadi, piam, di, piam. Then in the case of the genitive and locative, we again have an ending that begins with a vowel, and so in front of that, um, we don't find the e changing just into a y, but once again it changes into e y, so we have di, yoch. Then nominative, vocative, accusative are identical in root long i stems, and what we have there is di yach. So in front of an ending ach, we find the e once again changing into i. Then in the instrumental dative and ablative, the endings begin with consonants. So what we have is completely parallel to nadi to the regular long i stems, nadi bich and di bich, nadi biach and di biach. Then in the genitive plural, we have either completely parallel forms, so nadi nam and di nam, but here again we have an alternative form for the root long i stem, and in that we add not nam but am, once again this is the ending that you're going to encounter for consonant stems, and in front of this am, the e of di once again changes into i, so we have di am. And then finally, in the locative plural, we have an ending that begins with a consonant, namely su, or here changed into shu after the e. And in front of this shu, in front of the consonant beginning the shu, di just stays as it is, and so we have nadi, shu, and di, shu. That was long i stems. And the reason why this chapter just tacks on um, long U stems as well, even though, yes, that is a fair amount of information, is because long U stems are almost completely parallel to long I stems in the sense that they add the same endings and they have the exact same kind of internal sundi. So where a long I stem retains its long I, a long U stem will retain its long U. Where an I changes into a Y, an U changes into a W, so again, into its semi-vowel counterpart. Where a long I changes into E Y, a long U changes into U W, so short form of the vowel plus the consonantal counterpart. So um, when you look at these tables, you will see that they are just like um, the tables for long I stems, with one exception, namely the nominative singular of regular long U stems also ends in UCH, 
and not in u, which we might expect on the parallel of, for example, nadi. So we have a long u stem, regular long u stem bride, waduch, wadu, wadhum, wadwa. Notice here we have the u changing into a w, wadwa, wadwai, wadwach, wadwach, wadwam. Um, in the dual, wadwau, wadubiam, wadwoch, with the u either staying along u or in front of another vowel changing into a w. And then in the plural, we have wadwach, wadwach, wadhuch for the accusative. Wadubich, wadhubiach, wadhubiach, sorry, wadhubiach, wadhubiach. Then genitive wadhu, nam, and locative wadhu, shu, with once again the su changing into shu after one of the ru key vowels, namely after u. The root long u stems, again, try to avoid basically having monosyllabic forms, having one syllable forms. And so we have buch, buch, just like dich, dich, and then we have bu wam, just like di yam. Um, and in the rest of the forms, uh, we have the u at the end of the stem changing in front of an ending that begins with a vowel. In the case of buwa, we just have u changing into u. And then for the rest of the cases, we again have alternative forms. So we have either buwai, buwach, puwach, puwam. So just like the cases that we had in long a stems, long i stems, um, uh, root long i stems and in regular long u stems. Or we have an alternative set of endings, namely buwe, buwach, puwach, puwi. And those are the endings that we're going to uh, encounter soon when we look at consonant stems. Then um, again in the dual, bu wau, bu biam, bu boch. So um, in front of a, an ending beginning with a consonant, the bu just stays as a bu. And the, in front of an ending beginning with a vowel, the bu changes into bu wu, so bu wau and bu boch. Then plural, bu wach, bu wach, bu wach for nominative, vocative, and accusative. Then bu bich, bu biach, bu biach, bu nam, or bu wam, so just like with d, we had two alternative forms, and finally bu shu. Your first main task in this chapter is to familiarize yourself with the forms of long i stems and parallel to that long u stems. As always, there's a variety of ways, and as always, there's flashcards on the book website, um, or specifically on the Brainscape link um, that you can use for this purpose. But just to give you an extra incentive, um, Long I stems are particularly useful because actually there are a number of feminine nouns that are long I stems that are formed on the basis of masculine stems. And um, if you know about these, then you just have to memorize the masculine stems and you can recognize the feminine stems as being the feminine equivalent of whatever the masculine basis or basic noun is. So, for example, Dewi, goddess, is based on Dewa, god. Da si, female servant, is based on dasa, servant. Nari, woman, is based on nara, man. Notice it's not nari, but nari, so we have a long a ah in the first syllable. Then we have saki, female friend, from saki, friend. Um, that's a short i stem, which we're not going to be introduced to until chapter 26. Rajni, queen, from rajan, king. And Rajan is an N stem, which again we haven't had yet. And um, in the same way, you also find some long A stems formed. So, for example, Bala is a girl, and this is on the formed on the basis of Bala, which is a boy. Um, if you're prepared to recognize such forms, you don't need to memorize them, and that is just going to make your life as a reader of Sanskrit much easier. Now that we've encountered these two new types of noun stem, we actually need to go back and look at something concerning adjective agreement, i.e. the agreement between adjectives and nouns. So far, the only adjectives and nouns that we'd seen belong to the same declension, in the sense that masculine nouns and neuter nouns both were short A stems, the feminine nouns that we'd encountered were long A stems, and the only adjectives that we'd seen um, were short A stems in masculine and neuter and long A stems in the feminine, which has the effect that when an adjective is used together with a noun and therefore needs to agree with the noun, the endings of adjective and noun are actually formally identical. 
So in the nominative, I have a form priach balach, the dear boy, nominative feminine priya kanya, the dear girl, and priam mitram, the dear friend. Now, however, we have feminine nouns and adjectives from different declensions, and that has the effect that forms that agree, i.e. that stand in the same case, number and gender, may nevertheless have formally different endings. So, for example, if I want to say the dear woman, then I have my form na ri, which is feminine, a long I stem, and I combine that with the nominative singular feminine of priya, which is priya. Priya does not become an I stem when it's combined with a feminine noun. No, the feminine forms of priya are long A stems. And so I have priya na ri. In the vocative, I have priye na ri. Accusative, priyam na rim. In the instrumental, priya na ya, and so on. This is something that we're going to see quite a bit from now on, that forms that grammatically agree do not have formally identical endings. So this is an important principle to understand. And now for something completely different, namely Visaga Sandhi. Two chapters ago, we looked at the Sandhi of words that ended in consonants. Now, as the subject line suggests, we're going to look at the Visaga, sorry, the Sandhi of words that end in Visaga. And the basic thing that we need to know here is that when no other word follows, both a word final S and a word final R appear as Visaga, so appear as H. However, that Visaga is then subject to Sandhi whenever another word follows. The reason why we're treating Visaga Sandhi separately from other consonant Sandhi is that it's a little more complicated because what a Visaga at the end of a word changes into depends both on the sound that follows, but also on the vowel that precedes it. There are three different categories, namely um, we have Visaga preceded by A, Visaga preceded by A, and Visaga preceded by any other vowel. And so we are going to be looking at these three categories separately, namely at words ending in ach, words ending in ach, and words ending in any other vowel plus Visaga, so ich, uch, ich, uch, and so on. What you see here is a table of all the different possibilities for Visaga Sandhi. Um, it's split up into three columns. The leftmost column is that for Visaga preceded by any vowel other than A or A. The middle column is for Visaga preceded by A. And the uh, rightmost column is that for Visaga preceded by A. I apologize that um, everything in here is a little small. And yes, if you find this table slightly scary, you are absolutely right to do so. I think everybody feels like this when they're first um, uh, faced with this particular bit of Sunday. So let's take this apart a little bit. Now, Visaga is like word final stops in that it changes one way before voiced sounds and another in front of unvoiced sounds. The uh, All the lines that are, that are shaded, that are colored in in this table are Visaga before voiced sounds and the uh, lines that are not colored in are Visaga before unvoiced sounds. Which vowel precedes Visaga actually matters only before voiced sounds, so only in the shaded fields. Um, and when we look at the um, unvoiced uh, lines, so the lines that are not shaded in, we can see that the Visaga remains the same or changes in the same way in all three fields. So in front of nothing else, in front of zero, if we don't have a word following, Visaga just remains as it is. If we have k or k following, Visaga also remains as it is. Now if we have a palatal, a retroflex or a dental stop following, and these are unvoiced, then Visaga changes into a palatal retroflex or dental S. Remember, Visaga originally actually underlyingly was S. And the S that it changes into depends on the exact nature of the sound that follows. So we have not the dental S, but the palatal SH in front of palatals, the retroflex SH in front of retroflex sounds, and the dental S in front of dentals. In front of P and P, so in front of labial sounds, it remains exactly as it is. 
and it also remains exactly as it is in front of any sibilant, in front of any S sound, in front of sh, sh, or s, that's close to the bottom of the table. Now, in front of voiced sounds, it does matter which vowel precedes the visaga, so we see um, things changing in different ways. So, for example, in front of vowels, visaga in the leftmost column, preceded by any other vowel, any vowel other than a or a, visaga changes into an a. If you have a plus a vowel at the beginning of the next word, then the visaga drops, and so we're left with a. And if you have ach, plus a vowel at the beginning of the next word. Again, the visaga drops, and we're left with just a, except, and this is exception one that you can here see on the right, if you have ach plus short a, then the ach changes into o, and the a disappears. And so narach, apagatchati, becomes naro, pagatchati, the man goes away. And so you can see a naro, and then you can see a symbol that is here printed far too small. It'll be much bigger on the next slide. And this is the so-called awagraha. This S-like symbol is the awagraha. And it indicates that there once was an A at the beginning of this word, pagacchati, that is not pronounced anymore. That's been dropped through Sunday. But in order to confuse us not too much, or not confuse us more than absolutely necessary, the this formerly existent A, is still marked in writing even though it's not pronounced. So if we have ach at the end of a word and a at the beginning of the next word, then um, what happens is that the ach changes into o and the a at the beginning of the next word disappears, in pronunciation at least. Then when we continue, um, if we have visaga in front of another voiced stop, so for example g or g, j or j, d or d, d or d, B or B, Y or W, and also in front of L, and also in front of H. What happens is that Visaga preceded by any vowel other than A or A changes into an A. When you have A plus a Visaga in front of one of these voiced sounds, the Visaga drops, disappears. And if we have Ach plus one of these voiced sounds, the whole Ach changes into O. Unfortunately, there is another irregularity that we've got here, and that is in front of a. Visaga preceded by any vowel other than a or a, so in the leftmost table, gives us exception number two. So what we've got here is um, the visaga disappearing. And if the preceding vowel is short, so if we are looking at ich or uch, then this short vowel is lengthened. So, for example, if we have Rajnim Senabih Rakshati, he protects Rakshati, whom, the queen, Rajnim, how, with what, Senabih, with armies, then the Sunday that we get from that is Rajnim Senabhi, the E is lengthened and the Visaga is dropped, Rakshati. As with consonant sandhi before, there is a variety of ways for you to familiarize yourself with this admittedly rather large amount of new information. As mentioned before, you may find it helpful to print out or to photocopy the sandhi tables, to use them as uh, bookmarks, and then to refer to them whenever a particular instance of sandhi is unfamiliar to you. And the more frequently you do that, the more easily you will then remember that particular bit of sandhi. Alternatively, rather than looking at a table where each individual instance of Sunday is listed, again, individually in its own little field, you can look at a table such as the one that you see right now, which sums up what can happen to Visaga at the end of a word in um, a much smaller number of categories. And what we find in this table is the following. On the left, you can see the three possibilities for final sounds. So Visaga preceded by any vowel other than a or a, again written as just Visaga. Then Visaga preceded by a, leaving us ach, and Visaga preceded by a, so ach at the end of a word. These can change 
in three different ways. They will change in one way in front of voiced sounds, which is category A. They will change in another way in front of unvoiced sounds, that's category B. And category, category B has an exception, namely category C, that is Visaga in front of specifically palatal, retroflex or dental unvoiced stops. And what we find in these three different categories is the following. Visaga preceded by any vowel other than a or a, followed by a voiced sound, changes into an r. Visaga preceded by a and followed by a voiced sound just drops out, so instead of ach we now have a. And Visaga preceded by a, if it is followed by a voiced consonant, the ach as a whole changes into o, but before vowels, the ach loses the Visaga and so we're left with just a. There are two exceptions to Sandi of Visaga before voiced sounds. Exception one is the one that we find uh, much more frequently, which is if we have ach at the end of a word and a at the beginning of the next word, the ach changes into o and the a drops out. But to um, make reading words just a little bit easier for us, the fact that there once was an ah which now has dropped out is actually marked in writing and the way it is marked is by means of the awagraha, this s-like symbol that isn't pronounced but it just serves as a reminder that originally there was an ah. The second exception, much uh, uh, more rarely found, is if we have ich or uch in front of a word that begins with an R. And what happens there is that the Visaga at the end of Ich and Uch is dropped and the I and the U preceding it are lengthened. So instead of Ich and Uch, we get I and U followed by R at the beginning of the next word. Then coming to category B, um, actually, in front of unvoiced sounds, it doesn't matter at all what vowel precedes the Visaga. All Visaga in front of unvoiced sounds just remains as Visaga, except for the sounds in category C, namely palatal, retroflex or dental unvoiced stops. And what happens there is that the Visaga changes into a palatal, retroflex or dental S. So in front of a palatal unvoiced stop, the Visaga changes into palatal sh. In front of a retroflex unvoiced stop, the visaga changes into retroflex sh. And in front of a dental unvoiced stop, the visaga changes into dental s. And again, that happens no matter which vowel precedes the visaga. Visaga sandhi can be summed up even more coarsely in uh, the nutshell that we're looking at here. First of all, you need to remember the three different categories, which are Visaga preceded by any vowel other than A or A, secondly, Visaga preceded by A, and thirdly, Visaga preceded by A. And then you need to remember that these three categories behave differently in front of voiced sounds at the beginning of the next word, but behave exactly the same whenever an unvoiced sound follows. Then we just saw two exceptions. And of these exceptions, only exception one occurs with any frequency. So what you need to know is that ach plus a gives you o plus a dropped a, indicated in writing by means of this s-like symbol, the avagraha. If you know that, you're fine. And also from now on, you should, whenever you encounter a word ending in o, assume that this o is the result of an underlying ach. Whenever you encounter a word ending in a, you should assume underlying visaga. And whenever you encounter a word ending in any sibilant, so in sh, sh, or s, you again should assume underlying visaga. If you do that, then in practical terms, visaga sandhi is not going to be any problem at all anymore quite soon. That was it for this chapter. We hope that you found this video helpful. And if you have any comments or suggestions, we would love to hear from you. Please do write to us at ruppel at cambridge-sanskrit.org. And now, for your own work on this material, good luck and have fun.